This is the Jedberg Podcast. I'm the host, Fran Ricciopi. Each episode, I speak with transformative leaders, visionaries, drivers of change, and those dedicated to winning, no matter the challenge. The Jedberg Podcast is founded in the lineage of the special operations Jedberg teams of the past and is sponsored by Talent War Group, an executive search and talent advisory. Visit talentwargroup.com for more. A percentage of all proceeds is dedicated to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. They say football is a game of inches. One drop pass, one missed tackle, one overthrown ball often means the difference between becoming a champion or going home empty-handed. Professional football requires its players to be fast, strong, and smart. It's a sport, but it's also a $16 billion business where results are the only thing that matters. Austin Collie played wide receiver for the Indianapolis Colts and the New England Patriots, catching passes from legends Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. Austin set and still holds collegiate records in receptions, receiving yards per game, total yards, and consecutive 100-yard receiving games. He was drafted 127th by the Colts in the fourth round of the 2009 draft. He was elected to the Hall of Fame at his alma mater, Brigham Young University. Austin joins me on episode 21 to discuss how our drive for perfection is based in competition, the identification of our faults, and the need to correct those faults quickly, without compromise, and without delay, or risk having our weaknesses exploited. He shares his early realization that a focus on the fundamentals of catching, route running, and speed made him competitive against bigger and stronger receivers. He also speaks about the driving factors and unknowns players face when making the decision to enter the NFL draft instead of completing a senior year in college, and what it feels like to achieve the dream to play in the NFL. Austin and I also break down the importance of chemistry on a team and how COVID separations can inhibit innovation in organizations. He shares his lessons on the difference between personal accountability and responsibility to his team, himself, and his leaders. And he shows us that even though the NFL is full of superior talent, the greatest of all time never accept anything less than perfection. Austin also very candidly opens up about the importance of selflessness, something he learned during his mission supporting the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We also discussed the series of devastating concussions and injuries that slowly forced the end of his playing career. He explains the difficulties we face in accepting the end, but also how we can embrace new opportunities if we bring the same level of passion, dedication, and drive to our new endeavors. An NFL wide receiver turned technology startup executive in remote process automation, Austin proves that we are the only ones who can control how hard we work. He is the definition of our core tenant, hire for character, train for skill. Professional athletes grab our attention because of their physical ability. It's usually an impressive physical ability that most of us, even in our glory days, could not even come close to on, our wor- on their worst days. What we often look past, though, is the mental aspect of the professional athlete. The unwillingness to compromise a high standard when that standard is reached consistently, and then the movement of that standard to a higher level when it's achieved. It's an endless need to become better tomorrow than they are today. These are stories of personal and professional growth. The physical ability is there, but how they approach the mental aspect is something that has intrigued me more and more as I've learned more about professional athletes. Life's full of decisions, tough decisions for for professional athletes. There's extreme success, there's devastating setbacks. On this episode, we have Austin Colley. He's set and continues to hold records in the NCAA and at BYU, even becoming a member of the BYU Hall of Fame. He's personally evolved as a man, husband, father through his mission, his dedication to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's played alongside Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Reggie Wayne, under Bill Belichick. He's played in the Super Bowl. Yet he's also suffered injuries and concussions that end his, his career unexpectedly forced to transition to a different career in a new field in something other than the pursuit of his dream to play in the NFL. Yet through this journey, he's exhibited the nine characteristics of elite performance as we have defined them in special operations. Drive, resiliency, adaptability, humility, integrity, effective intelligence, team ability, curiosity, and emotional strength. In special operations, we say that special forces is a mindset, but it's a mindset to be a professional athlete. Austin, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. It was a great intro and, and honored to kind of be included or, or at least follow in the same description as what you special ops had to fall under, right? Or had to carry. 
Well, there's a lot of correlation and there's so many places that we can start, but football has been a part of your life for a long time. Out of high school, you, you were a prep and super prep All-American. You were voted Northern California's most valuable player. Your senior season, you had 60 receptions for 978 yards, 18 touchdowns. I played center and defensive end when I was in high school. They threw the ball to me one time when they tried me out to be a tight end and I dropped it after it hit my hands and they said, you're going back to the line. But you also graduated high school with a 4.0 GPA. You were recruited by Stanford, Arizona State, Washington State, Oregon State, Colorado, Utah, UNLV. And you chose BYU. Your father went there. Your brothers played there. You're a BYU legacy family. And then you go and you had instant success as a freshman. You won the Mountain West Conference Freshman of the Year. But I start here at the beginning because your early life is where it was ingrained into you that success is earned and perfection is required to operate at an elite level. And you credit your parents. And they said that once you started something, you were not quitting, no matter how miserable you were. Your father, Scott, talks about competition as a driver of your perfectionist mindset. And he said, quote, I believe that people are afraid to be put in a position to reach down and pull the best out of themselves. Competition does that. You've got to learn how to lose properly and improve things that put you in a position to lose, unquote. But to do this, in my mind, requires an incredible amount of integrity and humility. So I wonder, what is it about these values, these things that your parents taught you about competitive spirit in your early childhood that shaped your mindset and the diligence in how you approach a challenge? Yeah, I think what my dad says was dead on, right? I think the only way that you're going to get better is if you put yourself in an uncomfortable circumstance, right? If you put yourself out there and make yourself vulnerable in finding out what your weaknesses are, right? Because really in those moments, that's really when you find out what those weaknesses are through losses, right? Through trials and through competition, right? Every single day, me and my brothers would go out front, you know, when I was little and, and compete, right? And you'd quickly find out what you were good at and what you weren't good at and what you needed to work on. And that was with life in general, right? I wasn't ever afraid to lose because I knew at the, at the end of the day, I was going to find out what my weaknesses were. And I would eventually take those weaknesses and make them into strengths. I think that's a really interesting point about transitioning the weaknesses into strength. And that's something that's permeated through your entire career. You talked about it in college. You talked about it at the NFL level. And then it, it even came up after, and we'll talk about it a bit later, but when you worked with folks who are suffering from traumatic brain injuries and concussions, taking those weaknesses, transitioning them into strengths. And when I think about that quote from your father, lose properly and improve things that put you in a position to lose, that's where it's quantified. Absolutely. You quickly learn what what you're all about and what those weaknesses are during those losses. And only through that level of competition will you find out what those are. And that wasn't only in my childhood, but that was every single day, right? Playing in the NFL, you're constantly put in situations where it's 100% competitive and there's a winner and there's a loser, right? I used to tell people all the time, the, the games were the easy part. Practices were the tough part, right? Practices is where you found the most competition, where your job was on the line. You know, you would look over during practice at the other field and, and the GM would be working out a new wide receiver. That new wide receiver could potentially, you know, fill your role if you don't perform to that ability or you garner too many losses in those events of competition. So yeah, no, it's competition is really what kind of catapults you into becoming who you are, right? You find out really quickly in those instances who you are and what you need to work on to to become better. Yeah. There's nothing better as motivation than when you look over and somebody there is about to take your job. I, my high school coach did that to me once when I had, I had a bad game and I was not playing well in practice. And he's like, come over here for a second. And then he put another guy into my position and he's like, we're going to try him for a little bit. It's like, okay, this is never going to happen again. And that motivate <laughs> you take that motivation out and you're about to just go rip somebody's head off after that. But you played the position of, of wide receiver, one of the most difficult positions in professional sports. I mean, you have to be fast in a straight line, but you have to be quick and nimble. You got to stop, turn on an instant but you also have to be strong. You got to fight for catches against larger defensemen, linebackers, larger uh, defensive backs. And you also withstand some of the most vicious hits from people who are 50, 75 pounds bigger than you running at you at full speed with the sole intent to knock you down and take the ball away from you. But you also have to be incredibly smart and intellectual to understand the game. You have to be able to put yourself in the best positions to, to get open and catch the passes. 
You have to know the offense. You have to understand also equally as important what the defense is going to do, number one, proactively against you, but then also reactively depending on what you and the offense does. You've been asked previously, what made you so hard to defend as a pass catcher? What made you so good? And you said, quote, I knew that I wasn't going to be the fastest. I wasn't going to be the quickest or maybe the most athletic. I recognized early on that what I could do well was catch the ball, work on the fundamentals of route running. I knew the better I could run a route, the more I understood leverage and separation, the better off I was going to be. I tried to recognize that early on and work on my craft day in and day out, unquote. You've also been highlighted as an example for other players in the diligence that you put in studying game fill, learning the playbook, learning the playbook, perfecting your knowledge of the other players. So my question is, you know, our default position as type A personality men is that we can be the best at anything we do. It doesn't matter. Put it in front of me. I'm going to figure it out. But when did you realize that there were others who were going to be bigger, faster, and stronger, and that you would have to do something else to gain an edge over physical ability? Oh, I'd say from the moment I touched the ball, right? There was always, you know, growing up in California, there's competition everywhere. There's guys who are better than you everywhere. And in a position that is primarily featured through speed and quickness and just God-given athletic ability, you come to find out pretty quick that you may just be a guy in the middle of the pack. And so, you know, as you said, I had to quickly kind of take a look at, at what my strengths were, find out what those strengths were and leverage those strengths as much as I could to help get me in the top of the pack and, and kind of offset for those things that maybe I didn't have, right? And I wasn't slow, right? You know, going into my freshman year, I was pretty fast, right? I was like a 4-4 guy. I went on my mission. And once I came back from my church mission, I you know, had a bad high angle sprain that I never let heal because I just kept on, you know, I, I demanded that I played every game and didn't listen to the advice of, of some of the medical professionals. And, and that I think that affected my, my speed overall. But I wasn't extremely slow, but I wasn't like that 4-4 kid my freshman year. And I wasn't like the guys that uh, were running around me, right? Nor as quick and average height average size. But like you said, I, I, the one thing I knew I was good, I was running routes and catching the football, right? My understanding of leverage, my understanding of, of angles and spatial awareness, I knew I was above average at that. And so I made sure to kind of sharpen those tools that I had. Previously, we've spoken with a few folks who have talked about daily preparation, their daily routine, and their daily ability to just put their nose down and really start grinding it out. We spoke with Lisa Jaster. Lisa was the first female or one of the the first, she was in the first class that was integrated to bring women into Ranger School. She was the third female graduate of Ranger School. And we also spoke with Selena Kopik, who's a comedian in New York City, but she had a great quote where she says that comedy, it becomes successful and you become successful as a comedian 10 minutes at a time over decades. And I think about what you're talking about here and I say, okay, well, every day when you had to go out there and start to become a little bit better at route running, a little bit better at pass catching, what were some of the things that you thought about to say, like, I'm not going to go in early today. I'm going to take the extra reps. I'm going to put in the extra time. I see it's a mentality of of everybody. You have a goal, right? You have this long-term vision of where you want to be. And you know that certain things need to happen in order for you to get there. Right. And one of those things is being better than the competition. And with that in mind, you know that someone else is out there working at that moment in time. Right. As cliche as it is, having that mindset does truly help. Right. That's at least what helped me like continue to push me. Right. That if there was somebody that was going to get better right then and there, it was going to be me. Right. And I wasn't going to let somebody, wherever they were at in the world, outwork me. Right. And thankfully, to from the teachings of my parents and the players that I played with in the past and my siblings, right? The work ethic that they've all kind of exemplified and had that only helped me, right? In that quest, right? Of, you know, having that mindset that nobody, you know, there, there might be people who are stronger, there might be people who are faster, there might be people who are quicker and more talented, but uh, there's one thing that I could control and that was how hard I worked, right? And I was going to make sure that no one was going to outwork me. So you go to BYU and you have a wildly successful freshman year and but you actually stepped away from football for a time after that. And you conducted a mission under the church. And you stated, quote, that the mission is the hardest thing I've ever done. It may not be so hard for others, but for me, it was. 
unquote. Can you talk about that mission? I mean, what is it and why did you choose to step away from football and risk coming back an inferior physical state to conduct that mission? And then also, I mean, what was it so hard and how were you changed? Yeah. So in our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or we're often referred to as Mormons. You have an option when you turn 19. Now it's changed. It's 18 years old. But when I chose to go on a mission, it was 19. You have an option to go and serve two years in a country or, or place that's not of your choosing. It's picked for you. I happen to go to, to and be blessed with the opportunity to go to Argentina in Buenos Aires. And you go from 19 to 21 and basically teaching about Christ, his gospel, his teachings that are you know found in the Bible and, and a book we believe to be the truth as well, which is the Book of Mormon, and doing service, right? Performing service for the, the people of Argentina or the people of what, whatever mission you were called to. And you do that for two years, right? You only get to talk to your parents. You only got to talk to the parents two times a year, once on Mother's Day and once on Christmas for about an hour. The other type of communication you'd be able to have would be email or writing letters, which you got to do just one day a week. But as a 19-year-old kid, having never been in a different country, having to learn Spanish and to be able to communicate those things. And, you know, we were knocking doors and going from appointment to appointment and, and building houses from 9 a.m. till 9 at night, right? Getting up at 6.30 to, or 6 o'clock to do a, a Bible study. And that was every day, every single day for two years. And when you're a 19-year-old kid who had some success his freshman year, at BYU and football at the time was your main priority. There was some pain in getting used to that regimen, getting used to that schedule and kind of getting out of that mindset of just football being a priority. And thankfully, I had a great mother and father and an older brother that kind of kicked me in the butt when I had the thought of not going on a mission and said, you need to go on one. My older brother served as well in Brazil. He had just gotten home off his right before I was going to uh, about to go on mine. And I honestly had thoughts of not going, right? It was something that wasn't a priority to me at the time. But thankfully, my brother said, this is something that'll change your life forever. And it's not only life's not only about being a football player, but it's also about being a husband, being a father. And, and there wasn't anything that could prepare you more than what a mission could. And he was 100% right, right? Changed my life forever is the hardest thing I've ever done having to kind of put football to the side for two years and just think about others rather than myself, think about Christ rather than myself. And I'm glad I did. I, I wouldn't be the man today without it, right? Without having gone through that experience. You reference a lot as being one of the takeaways is the concept of selfishness versus selflessness. And I think that you just quantified it there a little bit when you said that you were maybe a bit selfish prior to that. And then that experience on the mission really taught you about this concept of selflessness that then carried through in your ability to forge a better team, to be on, on a team to build something as greater of the component parts or greater than the individual, right? So can you talk a little bit about what you took away from that in terms of the selflessness aspect and then how you applied that in the next stages of your life, coming back, playing at BYU, going into the NFL? Yeah, it's human nature to kind of think about number one, right? To think about yourself, think about how things are going to affect you. And when you spend two years of kind of being forced to think about everybody but yourself, you understand and start to appreciate the happiness that that brings, one. And also that, you know, the appreciation or understanding of the fact that there's a bigger purpose or a bigger plan than what you had thought, right? It doesn't just involve you, it involves others. And it's no different within a team environment, right? You got players who think about number one all the time, who think about how things are going to affect them. And usually on that team, that can be cancerous, right? Especially if you get all 53 players thinking that way. And I've been on a team that's thought that way. And it, it was not good, right? It was only for a short bit. But when I was on that team, it wasn't fun to be around. But thankfully, being on the Patriots, being on the Colts, I can't talk enough about the selflessness that went on within the Colts, right? You really got that team type of mentality. Everybody forgot about themselves and kind of put more priority on what the bigger plan was and what their part was going to be in that plan, right? For the betterment of the team, right? And if you want to have a successful career, you want to have a successful ending, it's the question needs to be, how can I help the team? How can I make the team better? Not how is the team going to make me better, right? Or what's in it for me, right? Those are truly the things that separate great teams from just okay teams, especially in the NFL, right? And the Patriots too, no different. 
So you come back from the mission and you, you have two, two more years now at BYU and wildly successful set records in 2008 across not only at BYU records, but also NCAA records for all of college football. And so I was thinking about how I was going to quantify this portion of the conversation. And I was, and I had initially wrote down, oh, I will ask him, how did he do when he came back from the mission physically? And I'm like, well, okay, obviously pretty well, considering he set all these records and went to the NFL. But January 9th, 2009, you announce you're leaving BYU a year early to go to the NFL draft. The decision for a senior to forego their senior year creates, I think, polarizing conversations at times for talented collegiate athletes, right? Some believe that it's in the best interest of the student athlete to stay and finish school. If you think about long-term after football you know, careers, others see the senior year as an opportunity to get hurt and ruin chances of going into a professional career and that the risk versus the reward of staying and, and maybe coming up one or two, a couple of positions in the draft or then, or even getting hurt, it just isn't worth it. So you got to go and forego the senior year. But leaders we have to make decisions based on what we know at the time with an understanding also of what we don't know. And the best leaders know that they can't keep the status quo if there's an opportunity to do better. And I think about this decision-making kind of in that concept, this is one of those decision points. So for you, why did you leave college a year early and enter the draft? Because this was rare for a BYU athlete, especially for a BYU wide receiver. It would have been very easy for me to stay. Right. And just to kind of give you, provide a little bit more context to the situation. All my good buddies were staying for another year, right? My quarterback staying for another year. A lot of the offensive weapons who are good buddies of mine staying for another year. So I had every excuse to stay, but I think I got to the point where I asked myself, what else do you have to prove? Right. What else is there to prove? And at that point in time, I think statistically, I couldn't have done any better the following year. And knowing that the only thing I could do is match what I did my junior year it, or do worse, right? Because unfortunately, you do worse. You're not going to get nearly the, the amount of clout that you had, right? And, you know, just the momentum of things kind of going into it. And I'm not going to lie, you know, part of it had to do with the faith that I had in getting an answer from God and, and my wife and I praying about it. And when I get an answer, I don't doubt it, right? And it was one of those things that just felt right. And my wife felt right about it at the time. And in hindsight, looking back on things, it was probably the best decision we made because I was able to play on a phenomenal team. Had I waited a year, I don't know if I go to the Colts, right? And honestly, I don't think I could have had a better experience had I played on any other team at that time, right? Going to the Super Bowl, getting the opportunity to start in the slot and getting to play with the guys I played with. Those guys taught me a lot, not only about football, but about life and about being a dad and a father. I mean, it was a phenomenal locker room, a lot of great leaders in that locker room made me feel at home. Well, that was 2009. You are drafted in the April draft of the NFL fourth round, 127th overall. And it's interesting in the the third, fourth, fifth rounds, right? A lot of people say, oh, if they don't go in the the first couple of rounds, no, but the core of the team is built in those rounds. I truly do believe that. And so you go in the fourth round, as you said, this is Peyton Manning's team at its peak. Your other players at your position are Reggie Wayne, Pierre Garçon, da- Dallas Clark at tight end. And you impressed coach Jim Caldwell. You made the t- you were third on the depth chart in 2009 as a rookie. That team went 14 and 2, went to the Super Bowl, lost to the Saints unfortunately, but that team was also 14 and 0 and then somehow lost two games at the end to the Bills and the Jets, which I guess we could talk about offline. But as a Patriots fan, I can't understand <laughs> how you would allow that to happen. I do know that the game against the Jets was was over 100 yards for you. So you had a, you had a good game against the Jets. <laughs> but there's a lot of guys who play college football. There's a lot less who play in the NFL, but it truly is the best of the best. And we've spoken before with Olympic gold medalist Laura Wilkinson, who won an Olympic gold on a broken foot in 2000 in with in t- uh, 10 meter platform diving. When we talked with her about the mindset, the fact that once you reach a certain level, whether it's the Olympics or the NFL, that physically there's not a tremendous amount of difference between all of the athletes. Now in football, certainly positions play a big factor in that but there's the big difference is that final 1% in the mentality, the way that you consistently approach the mental preparation and the emotional preparation 
of the competition and your personal preparation to prepare for the competition at that level. Can you talk about the difference between college football and the NFL, that level of competition, the skill, the preparation from the mental and emotional standpoint? Because we've seen great college football players go to the NFL and not make it. You know, Jamarcus Russell, Ryan Leaf come to mind as two of the big ones. But how do you make that adjustment and then continue to perform and get better when everything has been raised? So I remember going into my first practice with the Colts. And you would assume as an outsider, just watching over the years and just things that you hear, you would assume that the best players really kind of took an attitude of, or a casual attitude towards practice, right? Maybe not practicing every single day, you know, taking some time off just to kind of make sure that uh, their bodies are right. I was absolutely throttled when I found out from the very get-go, from the very first day, the guys who were the stars of the team, right? The Reggie Waynes, the Dallas Clarks, the Jeff Saturdays, the Paytons, right? The Gary Brackets, the Dwight Freenies, the Rob Mathises, they were often the ones who worked the hardest during practice. Those were the guys that never missed the practice if they could help it, right? And that made sense to me, right? I mean, you put in the work, you become the best, right? I mean, I think that makes sense to everybody. But typically, you don't, you may hear different things having not been a part of the team or not been on that level that there might be some players who were given every sort of athletic talent and athletic ability and could get away with maybe not practicing one to two days. But sure enough, day one, man, those are the hardest working guys. Those are the guys who put in the most time and their level and attention to detail, especially with Peyton and the way that he prepared for each and every single game is nothing like I had ever seen. Like I thought I worked hard in college and then I got there and I realized, okay, I need to up my game. These guys understood that the talent wasn't given and that it was earned, right? Wins weren't given, they were earned. And they'd been around the league long enough to understand that and to see it. I mean, this was an organization that was the most winningest organization from 2000 to 2010. And it wasn't by coincidence. These guys were hardworking guys. They had all the talent in the world. And I'm sure they could have gotten away with not practicing one to two days a week, but they refused to do it because they all had that mentality that they wanted to be the best and that they wanted to win every single game that they played in. And so they prepared like it. And that was a kind of an eye-opening experience for me that, you know, I kind of prided myself on being the one that worked the hardest. But once I got there, I was just another guy, right? And I knew, like I said before, I had to up my game and kind of match that level of intensity and preparation. And to be honest with you, I hit a level that I never even knew I had because of it. That's why I'm, you know, I'm forever grateful to those guys for the example that they had set for me. Well, you said of Peyton Manning, quote, he demands perfection. And then you said about yourself, you said, quote, the drive is something you're born with. There are many people who are more athletic and have more God-given ability than I have. But the one thing that separates me is the mental aspect. Everything has to be perfect. I can't just walk away from the practice after feeling sloppy or running the wrong route. It has to be corrected. Unquote. I like the last part of that phrase. It has to be corrected because I think just that's something we don't think about in, in elite performance. We just say, oh, well, we'll just get better next time. But it's the fact that you quantify it in, no, it has to be corrected now. It has to be fixed. It cannot go on any longer because if we don't fix it now, then we have to start tomorrow trying to fix it. Yeah. And that's a wasted day, right? You want to make sure that whatever corrections need to be made are made the same day that they're that the mistakes are are realized, right? So, no, that, that that was a big thing for me. I, I don't think I could leave the field knowing that something was off or knowing that something wasn't right. I want to discuss team ability for a couple of minutes. You brought it up a little bit ago, but I want to talk about the idea that the team is more important than the individual. The sum of the parts is greater than the whole. Everyone's working towards this same goal. I was having a conversation the other day with the head coach of the Boston University men's rowing team. In college, I was on the rowing team at BU and I support the team now as much as I can. But we were discussing the concepts of accountability versus responsibility. That responsibility is the sense that we have roles to fill with specific jobs to do. But accountability is that we have a duty to fill those roles and to do those jobs at a certain level of proficiency. And we have that accountability to do those jobs without compromise and without excuse. There's an expectation of performance by our teammates and our leaders that we must uphold and be accountable for. 
This concept of responsibility versus accountability is what I believe creates long lasting and resilient organizations that stand the, not only the test of time, but also the shocks to the systems, right? Personnel changes, wins, losses, all the things that can derail a strong organization. But there's also a concept with accountability and responsibility that once we meet expectations, we have to reset the bar, we have to raise it, and then we have to strive for that the next time. You play for Bill Belichick, you play with Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, but specific to the Patriots, they have this do your job concept. In special operations and the best teams and the best teammates, they won't even let others come in and critique them because by the time they get in a room where someone is about to tell them they did something wrong, the best operators will stand up and say, I did this wrong. You can't tell me I did it wrong because I beat you to it to accept responsibility and accountability that I let the team down. You played for two of the greatest organizations at professional sports at the height of their dominance. Can you talk a bit more about this concept of do your job, accountability, and responsibility, and how does it build and unify an organization and really create that team that doesn't let anybody off the hook? Yeah, so I, I think it goes back to just understanding that there's a bigger plan in place or that there's something bigger than you. And if you're able to kind of capture that in the hearts of all the players, right? That's something that is extremely unique. And like you said, I think the Colts and the Patriots had it during their time of dominance. Being able to, you talk about somebody standing up in a room and accepting that accountability prior to, you know, anybody coming forth or coming to them with it and having that ability to accept that that responsibility and to be accountable for their actions. Everybody on, on our team, especially at the Colts, you didn't have to tell them when we went back and watched film. I mean, really going back and watching film was kind of a just, it was something just to check off the list because at that point in time, I think everybody after practice knew exactly what they had done wrong that practice. As a matter of fact, they had probably already gone in and watched the film on their own prior to film session to see what they did wrong, right? And again, you only get that when you get players looking outside of themselves, right? When you get players constantly wanting to get better for the entire purpose of the team, right? To be a part or be a piece of the puzzle, right? Capturing that idea that I'm a piece of the puzzle in this grant in the grand scheme of things here. And if I do not meet that accountability, or if I do not fulfill that responsibility, I will throw the puzzle all out of whack, right? And that's a hard thing to do, especially with professional athletes, right? Because they do have this tendency to think about, I'm the only piece of the puzzle, and whatever affects me is the only thing that I care about, right? Getting a team of 53 professional athletes to think along those same lines and saying, here's my responsibility, and I'm going to hold myself accountable to it for the betterment of the team, for the bigger picture, right? For the long-term goal of the team. That's a unique thing to do is, you know, if you're a coach. Bill Belichick did it. Coach Caldwell did it. And a sign of that would be any pregame pep talk, there really was no pregame pep talk, especially with Coach Caldwell, right? It was just, you guys know what you got to do. Let's go do it, right? That's all that needed to be said prior to a game. I've been on teams where there, there was a lot of hoot and hollering, a lot of commotion, trying to get guys fired up, trying to kind of reinforce what that responsibility is or, and the accountability that they would have to have on the football field. And typically, those are the teams that, that don't have it, right? But the teams that do... Nothing needs to be said. Everybody knows exactly what needs to be done that day you hit the field. Let's take it a step deeper to the player or the teammate level. Chemistry, as it's called in a lot of organizations, between those within an organization, that a certain level of trust must be built. You said that chemistry isn't just built on the football field. It's built off the field, hanging out, knowing each other, developing what you call the sixth sense. We're in a world right now that sits at the back end of COVID where leaders of organizations now are trying to decide, do we bring our teams back in? Do we bring everyone together because of the importance of personal interaction? Or do we keep them separate because remote work has proved to be somewhat effective, right? I think we're still probably trying to put a number on what percentage of effective we've been. Maybe some organizations have become more effective in their business models. But so much happens when you sit in a room with someone day in and day out. Relationships can only go so far when you're on a computer screen and you have scheduled time blocks to communicate with each other. And outside of those time blocks, it's a, it becomes almost an inconvenience. There's no greater need for chemistry and the bonds that you, in which you instinctively know what your teammate is going to do in certain situations as the quarterback receiver relationship. You have to be in lockstep. There has to be total trust. It was something that we 
in special forces and on special operations teams develop after years of training and conducting operations and deployments together, where we actually begin to know each other better than we know our own families. What is it that is so important about chemistry between teammates in an organization? And how do you build it, not only in athletics or in the military, but also in the private industry as you sit in your role now? And then how does chemistry help to build the entire organization stronger? Right now, in today's current situation, I, to be honest with you, I don't think you get that at all. There's ways that you can maybe catch a glimpse of it. There's ways that you can orchestrate kind of that team type of environment. But there's something to be said about being with somebody eight hours a day or, or nine hours a day, both in the office, out of the office, or on the football field, off the football field. Just the more you hang out with somebody and the more you kind of see how they react in certain situations, you start to develop this, like I said before, this kind of sixth sense of how they're going to react in certain situations. You get to know each other and you start to become like this adhesive bond over time as a team, right? It was the same thing when I was on the mission, when I had a companion, right? It was the same thing when I was a receiver with Peyton, taking those opportunities to hang out together, to watch film together. And to kind of understand and get on the same wavelength as him. And before COVID, I'm sure there's a lot of business professionals that will tell you the same thing. They're just not getting that same level of camaraderie and that same adhesiveness that existed before. You may get some of it, but some, you know, kind of like what you said, I, I think not having that ability to kind of pop the head in the office and say, hey, can you help me with this? Or what are your thoughts on this? Right. And everything having to be scheduled, these time blocks kind of tears it apart a little bit right? It doesn't become as sticky, I guess you could say. But some of the greatest teams, this goes along with the uh, accountability, right? When you get a team that understands what level of accountability they should have or what level of accountability is required, they all understand it and they all accept it. When you're working together and you know what the long-term goal is, you know what the vision of the team is, that naturally starts to kind of happen over time. But it only happens when you're together in person, fighting the good fight, getting your hands dirty together. I venture to say you can say the same thing, right? With special ops, right? That's the whole reason why you guys, you said you probably knew each other better than the family did. That was because you guys went through things together that maybe you didn't go to go through together with your family. And those things could only happen when you're there being done in person, whether it was in the battlefield or off the battlefield, right? All those things matter. The team room was a combination of a lot of different places. It was an office. It was a training facility. It was sometimes ended up being some sort of dojo where you guys were fighting it out. It was, you know, it was a therapist couch. It was a bar. I mean, I think similar to a locker room, right? Where, you know, it's a, that was the place where it was the safe place. It was where everybody went in and it you know, didn't matter what was going on in that outside world. You know, you could talk work, you could talk relationships, you could talk family. You could throw each other around and just get some aggression out. Yeah. No, and Pey Peyton understood that better than anyone, right? Which is why during the offseason, we're always doing things together as an offense, always, right? Going golfing, throwing, going to dinners, right? He, he understood that, right? I'd like to say it was because he liked us, but I think <laughs> there was a higher purpose for him doing that, right? And he understood that's where teams are made, not only in the film room and, and on the field, but after hours. He liked you, but he also liked winning. <laughs> <laughs> so no success story comes without adversity. November 7th, 2010, game against the Eagles. You're hit on both sides of the head by two defensive backs, knocked unconscious, taken off the field on a stretcher. I watched the video about six times in the last couple of days. December 19th, 2010, hit in the head by Jaguars linebacker, knocked out again, second concussion-related injury that year, and it ended your 2010 season. And then 2012, preseason game against Pittsburgh Steelers, third concussion of the career. And then later on in the 2012 season, again against the Jaguars, you actually suffer a ruptured patellar tendon in your right knee and you miss the rest of the 2012 season. And then released by the Colts later on in the end of the 2012 and then 2013 briefly with the 49ers and then go on remainder of the season with the Patriots. Concussions and head injury protocol have come front and center in, in the NFL over the last 10 years. When you suffered these injuries, I think that was probably more at the beginning of the concussion and head injury awareness drive that they've been on. So there's been a lot, there was a lot less scrutiny on those plays, the events that lead up to those plays, what's allowed, but then also how they treated them and the mitigation factors uh, and how quickly they allow folks to and players to go back out onto the field. 
Referencing the head injuries, you stated, quote, my concussions were visually devastating. They didn't look good. Combine that with the public's perception of concussions. It was no surprise that no matter where I went after that stretch, I was constantly being reminded of my head injuries, whether it was people asking me how my head was or asking me what I'd do about it. I had people texting me, tweeting me, emailing me about my head. All I ever heard from the public and the media was, Kali will have dementia by the time he's 40, and he should be taking his family into mind, unquote. How did these head injuries affect you? How did it affect your play? You also approached treatment in a very open and positive mindset, and there was a, you had a different perspective than the media and the public did on this stuff, which I found was very interesting. And you referenced data, you know, real, real hard medical data. And so I'm hoping you might be able to talk about that for a couple of minutes and how it affected you and then how you approached having to come back from that and combating that fear to get back out on the field. Good question. You know, at that point in time, when I said those things, I was a young kid who was just looking to kind of get back on the football field, right? And I couldn't have the, I guess, the, the scrutiny against concussions kind of affect that, right? But looking back on it, I think if you were to ask me now how I felt, which you are, but how I felt about the concussions, right? I, I mean, it is a real thing, right? The effects that I've had from it, I would hope are chalked up just the old age and, and being a father of four, but you know, there are days where there's some days, right? Especially transitioning out of football. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of guys have a hard time with that previous head injuries, right? Transitioning out and really struggling with that identity as a football player and having to redefine themselves combined with the maybe brain, a level of brain dysfunction that they wouldn't get had they not taken a few shots to the head, right? So I don't know, for me, it's kind of a hard topic. Right. Just because uh, I think there's so many things coming out now, there's little research that that was being done when I was taking it. But now the more and more research comes out, the more it's, it, it has been a little bit of an eye opening experience. And now that I've kind of stepped away from football and haven't had that temptation to kind of get back onto the field and have kind of seen things in a bigger picture, you know, I, you can't help but but respect that. You know, I, I like to think that maybe I go back in that that moment and take a harder, a better look, right? What my situation was and maybe said some things a little bit different than what I said back then, maybe given the events a little bit more respect than what I did back then. Well, I'll tell you that the perspective that you took back then is no different than every special operator has when they're sitting there and they face injury over the course of their career. I suffered a, a stroke in my right eye while I was deployed to Iraq. They medevaced me to Germany but it took two weeks for me to be medevaced because I kept telling them that I would go onto the airplane and I never showed up to the airplane <laughs> until my battalion commander called me one day and said, you have no choice but to go get on that airplane. And then even then I thought, well, what if I just don't get on the airplane? You know, I had multiple back injuries, you know, same thing, or in the field hospital getting injections in, into my spine and you know, going out on an operation you know, the, the next night after steroid injections. I look at something that we have termed operator syndrome. Previously on another episode, we had Dr. Chris Free works very closely with special operations, military veterans, and elite performers in, in a lot of different industries. But he talks about operator syndrome, and that's what he calls the effect of a high performer when they've pushed for too far, for too long, and their physical, emotional, mental stability begins to erode due to decades of overuse and high-intensity activity, or what they call allostatic load on all of your systems. The average special operator, before they receive treatment for systemic issues physically, I believe it was 13 years, if I remember correctly from the episode, but they wait 13 years before they actually go and say, actually, I think I have a physical problem that I need to address, which over the course of a special operations career, that could be, if you're in something like Ranger Battalion, I mean, that could be 20 deployments deep at that point before you actually accept that you have a problem. I bring this up because in the best cases, right, people seek therapy and a vacation, you know, worst places, the worst spots, they become destructive to themselves, their families, their organizations. In football, I think about someone like Junior Seau, you know, legendary Hall of Fame linebacker, but the, the belief is he suffered from CTE and committed suicide. And since 9-11, 7,000 service members have been killed in combat or training, but 120,000 have committed suicide in that same time frame. And I appreciate you being so open and candid in this conversation about this difficult topic because it is difficult to discuss for sure when you think about all the people who are affected by these things, whether they're athletes or they're veterans. 
But I'm wondering if you could just maybe comment on having operated at an elite level for so long and had so much success. And now as you're able to take a step back and look at it, what's the advice to those who are in those positions now where maybe there's a sense of balance that can be learned from the perspective that you now have? I think that what makes elite athletes elite is they have one mind track, right? There's one center focus, and that is becoming the best and being out on the field and constantly getting better at the game. And I think if you take that away, if you take any of that away, I do think you miss out on an opportunity on maximizing your full potential at whatever it is that you're looking to do. Everybody I played with that's been great, they've got blinders on, man. I mean, it is like, I want to get better. I want to be the best. And it's consuming, but there is no happy medium. And I don't think they get to where they're at with a happy medium. And I would say the same thing about, you know, special forces. I can imagine if they're going in, they're going two feet, they're going all in, and they're putting those blinders on as well on how they could become the best of themselves, the best soldier, and continuing to in- improve. And that is the one track that continues to play over and over again in their mind. But I do think it is essential that you don't identify as only that, right? One of the things that has helped me is I'm a husband and I'm a father. And those those things hold a a massive part in my life. And that has kind of given me my identity as I transitioned out of football, where I don't think a lot of guys, I don't think they do that. I think you can be focused entirely on getting better, on becoming the best, but at the same time, not identify just with that one thing and not tie who you are into that one avenue. I think the guys that struggle in the NFL have done that, right? They've transitioned out. And it's a whole combination of things, right? But it doesn't help that all they've been known as and all they've known themselves as is a football player. And that's it. Yeah, I mean, transition is so is so difficult. 2016, you announce that you're retiring from professional football. You achieved your dream of playing in the NFL. But now what? I remember the day I left the army. It was the hardest and the scariest day of my life. Everyone I knew, everything I was good at, everything that I understood in my career. And for, as you know, you mentioned, I sacrificed everything for that career and that life was now in the rear view mirror of the gate at, you know, Fort Carson, Colorado. And I remember looking through the windshield going, I have no idea what's ahead of me. But football is a business. I mean, it's a $16 billion business in 2019. And I think, you know, numbers of projection for 2021 is, is going to be $16.5 billion. We did an episode with former top model Emily Sandberg Gold, where Emily talked about when she was modeling in her, in her young career, she always kept it in the back of her mind that she had a short shelf life. Eventually, someone younger, more trendy would come around and it would displace her. In Emily's case, it ended up being Giselle, actually. Football is similar. As long as you can produce on the field, you have support. Once you can't, it's not personal. It's a business. We saw this even with Peyton Manning after all the years he put in the Colts. And eventually, you know, the business says, well, you know, you got to move on. It's happened to many great since. You talked about transition and you said, quote, I don't think a day will go by that I won't wish on playing football. It's the game I grew up playing and I'm always going to want to be out there competing. I realized at a young age that I was good at this game and I really enjoyed improving. Part of the fun was challenging myself in order to see how good I could get. And I'm going to miss that part of it. I'll miss game days, I'll miss preparing for game days, and I'll miss the feeling that you get the night before a game. Those butterflies are hard to replicate in everyday life. And other than starting a family and serving my church mission, nothing has been more gratifying and rewarding as my four-year member of the Colts. It was the time of my life and everything I pictured as a little kid, unquote. So did you think about life after football when you were playing? What would that bring? And how did you accept that transition And then how did you take a step back, reset, refocus and say, okay, I've learned all these things about drive, perseverance, resiliency, grinding that got me to where I am as a professional athlete. Now I have to apply them to the next chapter of my life. Thankfully, the end kind of came over time, right? It wasn't just this abrupt, like you're done, right? It it started to kind of water or trickle down or erode as injuries kind of came into play, right? Concussions then other concussions, then my knee, and then ultimately going up to the CFL and finally kind of getting closure on the game. Like I did have some time to kind of think about it, right? And I don't think you ever can really comprehend the end until the end has come, right? Until that moment, like you said, you're driving in the car and you look back in your rearview mirror, you're like, wow, wait, 
it's done, right? Like I, I, I still think I'm seven years later, I'm still comprehending that it's done, right? I'll go out, I'll watch my boys play. And they were just at a, a BYU football camp and it's at, you know, it's in the BYU football stadium. And I do have those kind of moments where I look around, and I say, I'll never get to play this game again, right? Ever. But it feels like yesterday that you were catching passes, scoring touchdowns. Like, I can go on and do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I can't, but you think you could, right? I feel like I was 18 yesterday. Th- those times are tough. You kind of think back and you're like, man, I, I, you just have that moment of realization again. Like, this ain't happening again, right? And to say that it's easy, it's not easy even seven years after. I think, like I said before, man, to the day I die, I don't think there will be a day where I don't miss playing ball. And I think every single player can tell you that exact same thing. If they tell you any different, they're lying, right? You can't play something since you've been eight years old and be the one thing that kind of motivates you and pushes you and drives you. And then that come to an end when you're 30, 25, whatever years old and say, ah, I don't miss it. That's them trying to tell themselves that to get over it, I believe, right? That's what I think, right? Because I'll be straight up with you. You know, there, there won't be a day where I don't miss it and a day I don't want to be back on a, out on that field, right? Injuries and all. It's what I've known for, you know, 20 plus years and I love the game. Fortunately, I have boys now that I can, I get a watch and get a little bit of that, right? A little bit of those nerves before game day, the night before game day or, or the night before competition and kind of brings a bit of that back, but I won't get that again. It's tough, right? It's, it's extremely tough, but thankfully you kind of, what you are forced to do is, is find that next thing that, that you want to become great in and see how far you can get in that and see where your potential is in that and how you can elevate the ceiling in whatever venture that is. And now I've gotten that opportunity. And so we'll, we'll try and make the most of it. But I'm real with myself and thinking that it's probably not going to be like football. I don't love it as much as football. That's for sure. There's an impact piece to it, I think, you know, and I certainly suffered that when I got out and started working in, in the corporate sector. And you think, well, I was a couple of months ago, you know, in the basement of the Pentagon in the rooms that you think are only in the movies. And then you're out and you're doing something different. And, you know, for you, it's, you know, you're on the field with Tom Brady, Peyton Manning and all these greats and you're in the Super Bowl, And then you're, you're watching it on the couch going, you know, I used to be there. Yeah. Yep. Super Bowl Sunday is not a fun day in our house, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine. It's not really a fun day, probably in a, a lot of people's houses, unless you're in the Brady household. And then as long as you're right. in that household, then it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the best day. So, <laughs> so now you're at Jolt Advantage Group, a robotic process automation service provider. And you're going to have to define that for me in, in a few minutes. I had to look that, up, that one up. But the idea here is that there's an ability to automate so much of what's done on a software side of things, move mundane, repetitive tasks to bots and robotic software. The research out of, out of LinkedIn shows that robotic automation is the second fastest growing emerging job market, second only to, to AI. And there's a theory that you can free up human capital by giving so many of these tasks away to, to this level of automation. You've been the first to admit that you had no sales or tech experience prior to this role, but I really like that and that acceptance and the fact that you've, you have been open and honest about that is one of the first things you talk about because it's a core tenant of the talent war group and something we talk a lot about here on the podcast, which is you hire for character, you train for skill. You don't need a lot of industry experience to be successful in a role if you've demonstrated the characteristics that are required to succeed in that role. And then you can learn all the technical hard skills because you innately have the soft skills that are going to be required to, to for true, long-lasting, sustainable success. You said, quote, people want to have a purpose in what they do. They want to make a change in people's lives and they want to see results. I don't think there are a lot of technologies that provide all three of those things, but this definitely does, unquote. So first off, can you define robotic process automation? And then how do you make the jump from professional sports over to the tech world, and then really the front end of almost a you know, VC startup world. Robotic processing automation is basically emulating what humans do. So all those mundane tasks, those drag and click swivel chair tasks that are performed every single day, specifically in, in, in back office use cases, moving around data and, and Excel spreadsheets from one legacy system to another, that all can be automated seamlessly across any system or any price, any enterprise solution, which is 
pretty outstanding once you think about it, right? There's no requirement of API connection or API calls. You can just take data from one place and, and move it to the other or take or perform a task across these different legacy systems or enterprise solution softwares, right? So like you had mentioned, it's the second growing, largest growing industry behind AI, but actually has a bit of AI and machine learning kind of tied into it. So it is the next big wave, the next big thing, especially in enterprise sales. The leader in the industry, UiPath, who, who we are a, a premier partner of, you know, will often say they, they imagine a day where everybody has their own robot assistant. From turning on your computer and logging into those systems that, that you use to performing the tasks that I had mentioned, right? Taking data from one place to another and performing it as exactly as, as you would. And so these were the kind of the things that really got me excited. Before this, I was in an AI machine learning field or company, I should say. I was at a speech and language company called Canary Speech. And basically what we did was build algorithms to assess and diagnose certain diseases based on biomarkers that we found in our voice. A very advanced level of AI machine learning, a very advanced technology, extremely novel technology. And I still have a great relationship with the company and we're still a small partner in the company. But I could not deny the potential that this RPA technology has and the part that it'll play, not only in a single department, but across an entire organization. And that's what's unique about it. Everyone can benefit from this technology within an organization, within a company or, or corporation. And so the possibilities are endless for it. And that's what really got me excited and made me make the jump to join Jolt Advantage Group, who we talk about having a locker room type of mentality. And this group is probably the closest thing I've come to that. You got a bunch of dogs in the company that are willing to pour everything that they got into making a sale and, and uh, building up this company to be something bigger than us. And I love it. I thrive in, thrive in that type of environment and, and love the people I'm working with. So as we close out, the Jedbergs had to do three things every day to win and be successful. They had three core fundamental foundational tasks. They had to be able to shoot, they had to be able to move, and they had to be able to communicate. If they did these three things successfully every single day, it didn't matter what challenges came their way, they would be able to focus on solving those solutions or finding those solutions. What are the three things that you do every day to win and be successful? I would say communicate is one. That's for sure. Like I, I have to communicate. If I need help with certain things, which I for sure do right now in, the, in this point in my career, I don't hesitate to reach out, right? And I, I'd say kind of stemming off of that, I'd say the second thing is remain humble. As soon as I let my ego get in the way, that's when I'm always taking a turn for the worst. So understanding it and coming to the being okay with not knowing everything and not knowing what the right choice is, right? Or what the next thing to do is and being humble enough to kind of reach out to somebody and get that bit of information or get their advice. Some of the best coaches and best players that I've ever worked with were, were always the most humble, always looking for ways to get better. And they weren't afraid to admit that they weren't the best or that they didn't know at all. And so I think that's extremely important. And I'd say that the third thing is don't get outworked. Whatever you do, the only thing that you can't control or the only thing that I can't control, especially in this business, is the amount of work I put into it. So making sure that I kind of stay in that, that top tier of, of workers and always looking for ways to get better and move deals along, I'd say those are my three. I, lo I love that. I lo and especially the third, don't get outworked because you're so right that the one thing that you can control is you and your attitude and what you do every day. Nothing else. You know, other things can may maybe impact you, but how hard do you work every day is on you. I like it. Yep. So we talked about the nine characteristics of success early on in the show. And I always say that elite performers exhibit all nine at different points in their life, right? It doesn't matter what they're doing, but they always will exhibit portions of the nine at certain points in time, but then in the totality of what they do, they have all nine. I say that and then I take one and I apply it to each one of my guests. And for you, I think about drive, the need for achievement, growth mindset, be better today than you were yesterday, continuous self-improvement, constant hunger to do more, take it to the next level. You're a perfectionist in everything that you do. You've displayed what we call the whole man concept, that there's a lot of different things that you're able to do at a very high level. You have a passion for anything that you get involved in. There's a dedication to being the best. Otherwise, why would you do it? 
right? And if you don't approach it that way, is it worth your time? And I truly appreciate that about you, your story, the success that you've had at every level of your career, the success that I know you're going to have in this new role when you take this attitude and you take this character and you apply it to this organization is going to be something that the industry has never seen. I'm sure of that. (laughs) You will advance that. And so I know when we were speaking before we did this today, we talked about a time in 2013 when you actually traveled on a USO trip to Djibouti and I was there. And I I can't give the story now because I have to save it for hopefully one day when I have Peyton Manning on the show, I'll talk about when I kidnapped Peyton Manning. But we, I guess, you know, you had said you were on that trip. I wish that I had also kidnapped you and brought you and we would have met then, but I'm very fortunate and very thankful that we have since come together. Our paths have crossed. We've gotten to know each other. Amazing conversation, amazing story. I do wish you the best of luck. And I thank you for being so open, so honest and providing some real, true, valuable lessons learned from a true champion. Yeah, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that, man. And I'm honored to be on the show and wish we could have met back then. But honestly, it was one of the one of the best experiences I could have had at that point in time, going out and seeing individuals such as yourself and being able to kind of interact with them and see what real challenge looks like, right? Not just on a football field. So respect to you and thank you for everything you've done for myself, for my family and uh, for our country. Thank you. American Jedbergs went on to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Directorate of the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your host, Fran Ruchopi. We're brought to you by the Talent War Group, an executive search firm and talent advisory. We'll drive you to attract, retain, and develop top talent. With services like talent acquisition, leadership development, and keynote speeches, we work with you to create talent solutions to business problems. To get started, visit talentwargroup.com. Join us next week for a new episode of the Jedberg Podcast on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Ricciopi, the Talent War Group, and the Jedberg Podcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As former members of Special Operations Forces, the Jedberg Podcast and the Talent Warrior contribute a percentage of all profits to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, supporting the families of our fallen warriors. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.